At the turn of the 20th century, the streets of Victorian London were polluted, dangerous and heavily congested. This was a problem for Royal Mail, which was relied on to deliver letters and packages on time. The solution was to transport it underground. Down here are six miles of tunnels stretching east to west. It would become the world's first fully automated driverless railway and at its peak it would carry four million letters every day. I'm Katie Wignall, a London tour guide, and in this series, I'm going to be delving into London's hidden past. We're starting off with one of the capital's best kept subterranean secrets. An impressive feat of engineering with a long and eventful history. Right next to the Royal Mail Sorting Office at Mount Pleasant in Farringdon, you'll find the entrance to what became known in its later years as Mail Rail. We're heading 21 metres underground and these tunnels can get pretty narrow, so I'm going to need one of these and one of these. London's Post Office Underground Railway officially opened in 1927, but there had been many attempts to solve the capital's mail transportation problems in the past. As early as 1855, the idea of using underground tubes to carry letters was being discussed, and over the next few decades, there were various experiments using air pressure to push cars through narrow tunnels. It was only in the early 20th century that plans for an electric railway with driverless trains were approved. Construction of these tunnels started in 1915 and they used something called the Great Head Shield System. Essentially this is a huge metal ring and it protects the tunnel as you're excavating material. And these are huge, they're 2.7 metres in diameter. And before you lay the tracks, they form a perfect circle. It's the same system that we used for the underground and it's why we call the tube, the tube. Even though these tunnels weren't operational during the First World War, they were still useful. Some of the treasures from the National Portrait Gallery and the British Museum were kept here. It's even thought that the Rosetta Stone was kept safe in these tunnels. Although all of the tunnels were complete by 1917, the high price of materials after the First World War meant a significant delay in the opening of mail rail. It wasn't until 10 years later that it finally went into operation. So how did it all work? Well, there were eight stations along the mail rail and these were underneath major hubs like Liverpool Street and Paddington. And here at Mount Pleasant, which was one of the country's largest sorting offices. This is one of the later trains from the 1980s. As you can see, there's no room for a driver or passengers. If you can believe it, the original trains from the late 1920s were even smaller. They had to pass through tunnels that were only 80 centimetres wide, but they quickly realised that that was impractical. Along the platform, you can see these red lines, and this shows us where the trains would stop. 
Each of these trains contains up to 200 bags of letters. And these bags inside their trolleys are taken off the trains to be sent upstairs for sorting in the office above. Once they've been sorted, they come back down to the platforms on these conveyor belts. And then the workers take the bags, putting them back into the trolley and onto the train. When everything is ready, they press this button and they send them on their way east. In 1928, the Post Office Railway's first general manager was given a pair of white gloves to thank him for the first full week without delays, a big improvement. But the system wasn't perfect. Without cameras, conductors based at the platforms had no way of checking the train's progress inside the tunnels, and the trains could occasionally go off the rails. You might think that these sandbags were here to prevent flooding, but actually it was a case of runaway trains. Sometimes trains heading up these tracks towards the depot would lose control and start rolling backwards. In that case, the controllers were able to divert the trains on these tracks into the sandbags that acted like a buffer, and that helped prevent disaster. Flooding was still the worst fear of the people who worked down here. The River Fleet, an ancient London river that now flows almost entirely underground, was an ever-present danger. During construction, flooding caused one month's worth of delays. And then in the Second World War, a bomb hit the sorting office and more water rushed through these tunnels. It must have been terrifying for the workers down here, but amazingly, they were back up and running the next morning. After this incident, they installed these amazingly hefty floodgates to seal off the tunnels from more water. But thankfully, they've never had to be used. decades after the war, advances in technology meant that the system ran much more smoothly. Trains were eventually able to be remotely diverted to avoid hold-ups and crashes, and by the 90s everything on the network could be controlled by computer from one central point. Staff manuals give a really interesting insight into the working lives of the mail rail. In 1984, there was a rule strictly prohibiting spitting. Anyone caught doing it had to be reported. Towards the end of mail rail, it was less busy and employees had more time on their hands. At least that's what this incredible doodle of a unicorn seems to suggest. But that's not to say that there was no excitement down here in the last few years of operation. In the early 90s, these tunnels had their moment on the big screen. Now for a bit of Hollywood trivia. This train is unusually painted bright yellow, and it's because it was used in a 1991 film, Hudson Hawk. In the film, Bruce Willis is riding underneath the Vatican City, trying to steal a priceless painting. And the train is painted white and yellow, as that's the Vatican's colors. Commercially, the film was a bit of a flop, but thankfully for the mail rail, the money earned from filming helped fund parties for disadvantaged children. It was only a decade later that, rather suddenly, mail rail was closed down. These tunnels, which had been filled with the noise of trains and workers for over 75 years, fell silent. 
Down here is where they store rolling stock, which is no longer in use. In fact, really, there's no way of getting these trains out of the tunnels. Over on the other side is a really peculiar train that's blue. And this was a vacuum cleaner. It used to be sent along the rails and get rid of these iron filings, which could start fires. It's easy to see why this area is known as the train graveyard. So why exactly was this place shut? I spoke to head curator Chris Taft to find out. So you can see from the, uh, the dartboard here, oh my gosh, um, yeah. the sort of suddenness with which the railway kind of closed really. So a lot of the equipment was still down here, it was left exactly as it was when, when the railway service stopped. And these numbers were actually left on the, exactly on the dartboard as they here? Were, exactly as they were, the stay of the scores of the last game that was played down here. Yeah. Amazing. So even though the closure was planned, kind of what, what were the reasons behind that? So the railway stopped, essentially in a nutshell, stopped going where it needed to go to. So the number of buildings above this railway that were um, in operation by Royal Mail and by the railways had declined. Um, the single biggest factor was in 1995 when the mainline rail operators stopped Royal Mail from using the London terminal stations at mm -hmm. Liverpool Street and at Paddington. And as a consequence of that, this railway sort of function passed really. So the purpose of this railway was to link sorting offices to mainland railway stations. So from that day on in 1995, it was no longer connecting railway stations, it was only connecting sorting offices. And the number of sorting offices at the same time was declining. So by 2003, there were only three sorting offices being connected together by this railway. And the places it needed to go to, such as Heathrow and Wilsdon, this railway didn't go to. So when that final decision was made, clearly it was quite sudden for everyone working down here. It had been planned for, for a while, but there'd been no real plans as to what to do with the railway afterwards. So on the last day of service, people just walked away. So things were left, drinks mugs were even left down here, dartboards were left, you know, things were just left as they were. People walked away, people took personal effects away, but all of the equipment remained down here. So it was literally just abandoned on that day. Gosh, so everything you see here is pretty much as it was when it closed? Yeah, pretty much as, as on this platform, pretty much it, it was as it was when it closed down. Yeah, there's a, a few things that we've added in order for the visitor attraction, but, but basically all of the, uh, the trolleys and things that were down here were down here when it closed. And I mean, everyone loves the idea of abandoned tunnels. Surely there's been some crazy ideas of what they could do with this space. There's been lots of ideas. There's been lots of proposals to turn it into kind of a cycle superhighway under the streets of London, to use it for storage of goods and services, because it's quite a climatically stable environment down here. So people were proposing to store wines and whiskies down here. There were proposals to have a mushroom farm down here at one time. Um, all of these ideas have, have not, you know, not come to come to fruition. The only idea that ever came to anything was the Postal Museum's own plans. So this place has a phenomenal history. What do you think is the main legacy of the mail rail? I think it's the, the, the importance of its role in keeping people connected. You know, the postal service was about people connecting with each other over distance. And, and mail rail was a part of that process of speeding up that, that communication, allowing people to, you know, allowing messages to get more quickly across London. <laughs> Luckily for us, these tunnels had been preserved to remind us of that legacy and the significant role that they played in the capital's history. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to hit the subscribe button and leave us a comment, and I'll see you in the next episode of Hidden London. Thanks for watching this video on the History Hit YouTube channel. You can subscribe right here to make sure you don't miss any of our great films that are coming out. Or if you are a true history fan, check out our special dedicated history channel, historyhit.tv. You're going to love it.